Early morning, late November, on the streets of Rio Piedras, a commercial district in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Shopkeepers are bracing for another hectic day. At a busy intersection sits the Umberto Vidal building. It's the headquarters of a popular chain of shoe stores, offices above and retail stores at street level. But lately, shoe store manager Arturo O'Neill has more than shoes on his mind. A strange smell has been lingering in the store for over a week. It comes and goes. Some smell it, others don't. He's made calls and complaints with no results. Arturo O'Neill vows that if he doesn't get answers today, he'll refuse to open up tomorrow. But those answers will come too late. Suddenly, the Umberto Vidal building shudders. And an explosion rips through its core. In one deafening second, the first three floors collapse into the building's basement. Only the top floors and the building's outer shell are left standing. There are 33 fatalities, crushed under the rubble or killed by flying debris. And in the street, injuries and destruction for blocks around. A cloud of dust and fear rains down on Rio Piedras. Was it a bomb, an unlucky accident, or a series of deadly mistakes? Investigators from across Puerto Rico and the United States descend on the scene. But the puzzle at the core of this disaster is as mysterious as it is deadly. Puerto Rico is an idyllic island in the Caribbean where tourists come for a break. But in its capital, San Juan, locals are gearing up for the pre-Christmas rush. The district of Rio Piedras is a vibrant mix of shops, restaurants, and family life. Near its center is the Umberto Vidal building, a modern six-story complex and the headquarters of a thriving family-run business. Umberto Vidal sells shoes and accessories. They have over 30 stores in Puerto Rico, and business is good. But this morning, November 21st, 1996, the store manager isn't smiling. Arturo O'Neill smells something disturbing in his store, and it's been bothering him for more than a week. The problem is, not everyone can smell it. Air conditioner maintenance workers, a father and son team, arrive early this morning to do their routine monthly checkup. They can't smell anything unusual. In an office a few floors above is 24-year-old secretary Maricela Loriano, 30 minutes early for work and eager to start the day. It's 8 a.m. I opened the window, Howard on my computer. But this morning, Maricela feels a chill in the office air. I noticed it was very cold, so I turned up the heat to 65 degrees. Milagro Saavedra has been an office worker at Umberto Vidal for nine years. She too arrives early for work, fitting in a quick chat in the store before heading upstairs. Arturo's brother Orlando drops in on his way to work at another Umberto Vidal store only a few blocks away. Today, Arturo needs some cheering up. Orlando O'Neill. When I arrived, my brother was a little pale, and I asked him what was wrong. He said he was sick of a smell that seems to be coming from the store's basement. Maddeningly, the smell seems to come and go. But Arturo is convinced it's gas. I told him, look, if you want me to go down to the basement and check it out, I will. So I go down, and up come two rats, a little drunk, and I say, look, Arturo, two rats. And he says, yeah, yeah, they've been coming up for the past two or three days. Orlando finds the smell overwhelming. I told him you can't go down there. The smell is so strong it makes you dizzy. Arturo says he's already called the gas company four times in two weeks to come and check, but their instruments show nothing. 
estaba bastante molesto. Lo que pasa es que no puedo decir todo lo que dijo. He was very irritated, but I can't repeat all the things he said because they weren't nice things. But he was very, very irritated and bothered. He even said that morning that if they didn't do anything about it that day, he was going to close up the store and not return. Orlando has to leave. His last words to his brother as he heads out. I'm going to leave before there is an explosion. I said that joking to him. And he said a few bad words back to me and says, what, are you crazy? Don't say things like that. And I said, I'm just kidding. Jorge Ibanez Jr. steps out to get a ladder from his truck parked down the street. His father, Jorge Sr., continues to work his way through the building. It's almost 8.30. Milagros and a colleague chat in the fourth floor lobby, waiting for their offices to open. One floor down, Maricela chats with Carmen, her supervisor. Suddenly, there's a tremor, then a deafening blast. Like a bunch of dynamite. A million things, all at once, but all in one moment. The sound was loud, and in one instant, and then it was over. It was horrible. Everything goes black. Before the blast, Milagros was sitting by the elevator on the fourth floor. When she comes to, she's surrounded by a mountain of debris. Three inner floors of the Umberto Vidal building and part of the fourth are gone. Their remains lie in thick layers of rubble in the basement. There are survivors, but many are dead. And the cause of this horrible explosion is both a mystery and a paradox. A tremendous explosion has ripped through the Umberto Vidal office building. People lie injured and dead in the streets, and many more are trapped in the wreckage. No one knows what exploded or why. Air conditioner service technician Jorge Ibanez Jr. has left the building only minutes before, but his father is still inside the building. There are many people on the ground, people all bloody, with large flesh wounds, the building on the ground. In that moment, it was chaos. I tried to enter, they didn't let me. I'm going crazy. I'm going crazy because I don't know what's really going on. Minutes earlier and several blocks away, in the office of another Umberto Vidal store, Orlando has just arrived at his desk. The lights flicker, and he hears a tremendous bang, then the lights go out. And I say to Santi, I think it was a transformer, because the lights have gone out. And he says, it can't be that, it was too loud. This was a bomb. And then I remember in that moment, the gas. I call, and the phone keeps ringing. They're not answering the phone. One of the first paramedics on the scene, Juan Ramos. When we got there, we see what's there and think, Jesus, what happened? What is this? Everywhere you look, there was a body, or a body part, blood. Things hanging from the building up above, rocks falling. There was no street there. There was a stretch of dirt, rubble, and cement. Police officer Jose Maldonado. Because it had been a while since I had been in the area, I thought, wow, they're constructing a new building here. But no, it was that the building had disappeared from the explosion. The interior of the building disappeared. You could only see the columns or the outer structure. The remaining structure is highly unstable and the site is extremely dangerous. And somewhere inside is Orlando's brother, Arturo. Someone told me, no one here survived. You should leave. And I said, no, I want to find my brother. 
the person grabbed me and dragged me away. On the third floor, Maricela has been thrown against the wall and down to the ground. She's conscious, but afraid to open her eyes. She stirs cautiously and tries to remember where she is and what happened. The last she knew, she was talking to her supervisor. Carmen! Carmen! I yelled out, are you okay? Stay where you are. She crawls, blinded by dust, near the edge of an abyss that drops three floors down to the basement. I walked around chairs, rocks, dust, until I found her. Made physical contact, and we stayed in a small corner. The dust started to settle, and I could see things a little more clearly. It was then that I realized the magnitude of what happened. In that moment, I had a bunch of thoughts. I started thinking, am I going to die, or do I fight this and leave? Maricela notices her supervisor is wounded. The gash was very deep and wide. There was a lot of skin and muscle hanging out. Maricela takes off her slip and uses it to tie a tourniquet. Then they wait for rescue, huddled in a small corner of an office that no longer exists. Emergency crews rely on ladders to rescue those trapped on the upper floors, but others are not as lucky as Maricela and went crashing down into the basement. They are now trapped or crushed under layers of heavy debris. Milagros is slowly coming too, 50 feet down from where she last sat, chatting on the fourth floor. At first it was very silent. It seemed like it was empty, and then you started to hear lots of people screaming and calling out for help. At this point, I still thought I was upstairs in the office. Milagros tries to move, but she can't. She's in excruciating pain. A colleague manages to crawl over to her and tries to help her up. Then I heard a man yell, is anyone still alive down there? That's when I looked up and realized I had fallen down to the basement. Then my colleague asked me if I could get up and leave, and I said yes, and not to leave me there. I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to leave. I knew whatever happened had been huge. So bit by bit, we started to move. My arm was badly hurt. We dragged ourselves along the floor closer to an area where you could see that the police and firemen were already arriving. Orlando is desperate to find his brother Arturo. Someone suggests he looks in the makeshift morgue set up nearby. I went there and I started looking at the corpses. There were maybe six or seven bodies in the morgue, and none of them were my brother. Then another person came up to me, and he said he must be trapped under rubble. Emergency workers rescue Maricela and her boss by ladder. Once down on the ground, she calls her fiancé. My office had exploded. That was all I kept saying. My office exploded. Come and pick me up. It was then I noticed I was covered in dust, that I was bleeding from my nose and mouth, that I was filthy and sore all over my body. I hadn't come to realize yet what exactly had happened to me. Milagros's injuries overwhelm her. Her shoulder is dislocated, her elbow shattered, her leg is broken, her ribs fractured. In the first moment, it was adrenaline. But once I got out of the building, I couldn't move. I couldn't respond or move. My only thought was I wanted to leave. Milagros is in critical condition and must be airlifted to hospital. But for those still missing, time is running out. 
The skeletal remains of the Umberto Vidal building are trembling. Engineers are on site, keeping a close watch on the building. At 10 a.m., 90 minutes after the explosion, the rescue effort inside the building is called off because it isn't safe. They have recovered 18 bodies and transported 80 people to hospitals, but others have yet to be found. Emergency crews are back inside the blown out building by nightfall of the following day, but now inside the building, they are only recovering bodies, not survivors. Jorge Sanchez Jr.'s father and Arturo, Orlando's brother, are still missing. It's the worst explosion in Puerto Rico's history. What could have caused such a deadly blast? Some people talk about how gas-like smells were noted in the building before the explosion. The fact that there was no fire at the scene is consistent with a gas explosion. But there's a big problem with that theory. There was no gas service to the Umberto Vidal building. There were no gas appliances. No gas had been used there for over 10 years. The next morning, dust and smoke are still settling, and many of the dead still remain buried under three floors of rubble. But already, public pressure is building to solve the mystery of the Umberto Vidal explosion. Over 80 people who were in and around the building have been injured. Survival was a question of circumstance or just plain luck. Milagro survived because she was on the top floor that pancaked into the basement. Maricela because she was on the third floor, but near the building's outer edge. I am grateful for many things from that day, that I survived and God gave me a second chance, that I was given the corner office because that was the most sturdy and safest. Two or three girls who were on the side were fine. They got out the windows. Because I was in the center, I fell, because the center of the floor caved in and collapsed. The less lucky were in the middle, on the lower levels, buried below floors of debris. 33 people are dead or missing and presumed dead. Was this a bomb? Perhaps the work of a notorious terrorist group, the Macheteros. They've set off bombs in urban centers before, but not for years. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms arrive from Florida and quickly begin their investigation. Is there evidence of explosives? Special Agent Frank Malter. We're criminal investigators, so we're looking at it from, from a crime perspective uh, and, and seeing what it is and how it happened and see whether or not, in our opinion, whether a crime happened or not. They take samples and swabs of concrete and plaster to test for explosive residue. These samples are flowing back to ATF labs for testing. But already, the explosives experts are doubtful. They aren't seeing other telltale signs. When you get into a uh, high explosive, uh, the speed of it usually creates a crater usually creates um, uh, a lot more damage to structural steel. Within 24 hours, results come back from the lab, negative. So when the swabbings came back negative, we knew that in the area of the most damage, we didn't have any explosives residue that we found then. But another rumor is more persistent. The reported smell of gas when no gas was used in the building. So what kind of gas was it, and where did it come from? Air conditioning maintenance worker Jorge Ibanez Jr. spends four sleepless days and nights at the site of the devastated building where he last saw his father. His body is yet to be found, but investigators have a special interest in his truck. The father and son maintenance crew had kept gas cylinders in the truck used for welding, and the investigators are viewing any possible source of gas in the area with suspicion. It was very intimidating and stressful. There were some who were very nice with me, but there was a few from the gas company who were very intimidating. Even as Junior and his gas canisters are quickly eliminated as suspects when the acetylene they use for welding can't be connected to the explosion. But Jorge has something revealing to say. 
that the store manager Arturo O'Neill complained bitterly about a gas smell in the Umberto Vidal building that morning, just prior to the explosion. A criminal act ruled out. The National Transportation Safety Board now leads the search for answers. The NTSB is responsible for pipeline accidents. NTSB investigator Cliff Zimmerman. The devastation was just amazing that when you went in there and saw what happened to the building, you just, you know, want to do your best job to find out everything you can so that you can prevent an accident like this from occurring again. While recovery workers and investigators continue to sift through the rubble, interviews with witnesses continue, and they tell a story that begins many days before the morning in question. During the interviews, a number of Inberto Vidal uh, employees told us that they had smelled gas uh, for at least a week prior to the, when the explosion occurred. What emerges is more than a week of frustration and worry for Umberto Vidal store manager Arturo O'Neill. Witnesses tell investigators of Arturo O'Neill's persistent efforts to solve the mystery of the foul smell that he believed was coming from the store's basement warehouse. He was convinced it was some kind of gas. On November 14th, six days before the explosion, Arturo asked the San Juan Gas Company to come to investigate the smell. The gas company's technician uses a handheld meter that sucks in air and measures the percentage of gas present but his equipment gets no reading of gas. In his report, the technician notes a slight odor of gas on the street, but doesn't detect any gas in the basement. The next day, Arturo calls again, and the gas company sends a team to the Umberto Vidal building. Once again, they detect no gas in the basement, so they begin testing outdoors, drilling bar holes into the soil and testing with a combustible gas indicator. Results are negative. Monday the 18th, the smell is back, but now Arturo isn't the only one smelling it. Another employee who wasn't at work the day of the explosion recalls the powerful smell vividly, Maria Lopez. A client asked me for a pair of nylons and I went downstairs because I knew we had the nylons. When I went down and then came back upstairs, I came out very pale from the smell. And I went outside the store to get some fresh air because I got dizzy. Maria Lopez also remembers her anxious boss, Arturo. He kept saying, Maria, something bad is going to happen here. Arturo O'Neill's frustration builds. Now customers are complaining about the odor. San Juan Gas sends its workers again, and once again they dig holes in the street to test for leaks in the pipes below. And again, they find nothing. Wednesday, November 20th, the San Juan Gas Company investigators return. The team leader goes through the basement with Arturo, but all he smells is the strong odor of new shoes. The smell of shoes is rubber and is strong. We were already used to it, but with this odor, it was like the smell of something rotten. That is, it was so strong, it was no longer just a shoe smell. It was much stronger. Arturo's brother Orlando recalls the early morning of the following day, Thursday, November 21st, the last day he saw his brother alive. And what Orlando remembers is the last thing he saw when he left the store, a gas company truck parked across the street. In fact, that morning, a San Juan gas technician was back in the neighborhood directly across the street from the Umberto Vidal building. The technician was badly injured in the explosion, but he has something interesting to say to investigators. That morning, after testing a number of bar holes for gas, all negative, he suddenly got a positive reading for combustible gas of 20%. That was the last thing he remembered before the explosion, mere seconds later. The technician had detected combustible gas, but too late for Arturo O'Neill and for the families of those whose bodies have been recovered. But now the investigation moves forward quickly. One of the first things we did was we d uh, conducted some combustible gas indicator tests in the soil around the uh, building. Investigators drilled deep into the soil. 
This time, their readings are positive for combustible gas. We took some samples and we sent them off to an independent laboratory and they confirmed that the gas that we had found was actually propane. Gas was present in the soil after all, but why only seconds before the explosion and then after? And why only in the soil when the smell and the explosion seemed to come from within the building? Investigators confirm that propane gas is present in the soil around the outside of the Umberto Vidal building and may have caused the explosion that killed 33 people. But where did this gas come from? The building itself had no gas installations, no gas pipe feeds, no use for gas. National Transportation Safety Board investigators survey the neighborhood. There is a restaurant up the street from the Umberto Vidal building. Large propane tanks are stored against a wall outside. An underground fuel line feeds the gas into the restaurant's kitchen. Could this have been the source? The restaurant tanks are checked for leakage. A tiny leak is found at the above ground shutoff valve, but the line into the restaurant kitchen is fine. Nearby propane tanks aren't responsible. That leaves only one other possible source of propane, buried gas pipelines. With help from the San Juan Gas Company, which supplies the propane, the National Transportation Safety Board maps out the location of underground pipes in the area. And step by step, working their way up the road from the Umberto Vidal building, investigators expose the maze of pipes that lie below the surface. It's a painstaking process that reveals an underworld of urban infrastructure. More than 20 pipes and conduits running in a jumbled maze beneath street level. They find water mains, a sewer main, a plastic gas line, a gas main, telephone lines, and electric conduits. Some are in current use, others long since abandoned. They focus in on a plastic pipeline that carries propane gas. Could it be leaking? Investigators pump helium into the plastic pipe, and when they begin to test the soil nearby for helium, the readings are positive. They start to dig. They find a point where the plastic gas pipe runs crossways just above a water main. It feeds propane gas to another nearby restaurant called Chicken Kingdom, and the plastic pipe is visibly damaged. As a matter of fact, before we got down to it, we could see that the soil was discolored around the uh, break, and so we knew we were getting close to it at that point and, you know, just kept on digging very carefully and, uh, you know, pushed the soil away from the pipe and then we could see the crack. Investigators discover that five years before, the Puerto Rico Aqueduct and Sewer Authority installed a water main directly underneath the gas line. But the hole dug for the water main wasn't backfilled properly, leaving a space between the plastic pipe and the water main leaving that section of the gas line with no support. The crack is serious, leaking at a rate of 100 cubic feet per hour. But could this leak have caused an explosion half a block down the road? The San Juan Gas Company's owner, Enron Corporation, steps in with a new theory. The soil in that area is very fine, not porous enough to allow gas migration. A propane leak could not have migrated as far as the Umberto Vidal building. They say everyone's right about the combustible gas, but wrong about the type. It wasn't propane gas that exploded that morning, but methane gas from the San Juan sewer system. Methane occurs naturally as organic material breaks down, and it's highly explosive when concentrated. Enron's investigators claim that methane gas made its way into the Umberto Vidal building, and once it reached sufficient density, any electrical spark could have set it off, and the theory has to be taken seriously. Only a few years before, in 1992, a devastating series of explosions in Guadalajara's sewers blows open miles of city streets. Over 200 people die, but that disaster was caused by dumping toxic waste in the sewer system not by methane gas alone. Families of the victims and other claimants hire Aptec Engineering out of California, experts in the field of forensic engineering, to wade into the gas debate. Jeff Grover, Aptec Engineer. When you go into an investigation like this, you try to maintain an open mind. 
Aptec calls on the very special expertise of environmental engineer and sewer specialist, Dr. Joseph Molina. If that building was blown up because of sewer gas, then just think of how many buildings and how many people would have been living under anxiety that their building's gonna blow up because of the infrastructure. Could the sewer system have produced enough methane to fuel the Umberto Vidal explosion? That depends on the quality of venting and the plumbing and the water flow of the sewers. Molina travels to Puerto Rico to take a closer look. We looked at the sewer system where the building was uh, located. First of all, was there enough flow in the pipes to keep them clean? If they're clean and the water's moving fast enough, there's no way you can accumulate the solid organic material that would be the cause of methane generation. Molina's first impression? The system looks healthy. Next, Molina checks on plumbing standards in the Umberto Vidal building. If the plumbing system is properly installed, that gas goes right out the top of the building. It cannot get inside the building because every fixture, plumbing fixture, has a water trap in it. Dr. Molina concludes that the state of the sewers and general plumbing in the Umberto Vidal building were satisfactory, but he's not finished. Each person contributes about two-tenths of a pound of solids per day. To get one cube, one pound of solids, that'll take five people. Huh? That's maybe one apartment. So how much human waste would it actually take to create enough methane gas to cause an explosion the size of Umberto Vidal's? A hell of a lot of sewage is going to collect uh, before you get that many solids. Molina calculates that it would take dozens of buildings weeks, maybe months, to produce enough sewage and enough methane to blow up the building. I have a hard time understanding that you could let the sewer be blocked for a month without someone complaining that they're having sewage coming into their houses. So it seems unlikely that methane gas leaked in from the sewers or was a result of a plumbing malfunction in the Umberto Vidal building itself. But could methane have come from somewhere else? Investigators look for answers in the shell of the blown out building. Both scenarios assumed that the explosion occurred near the center of the building. So both of them showed damage going outward. But the two scenarios diverge there. Propane gas is heavier than air and would have accumulated at the lowest point of the building, in the basement. And methane, being lighter than air, would have floated, according to the methane gas proponents, to a false ceiling between the second and third floors. The mystery of the Umberto Vidal explosion now hinges on the exact point in the building where the blast originated. The stakes are high. Whoever is responsible will have to answer for the injuries and deaths of many people and pay out millions of dollars in damages and compensation. Most people in Puerto Rico blame the San Juan Gas Company for a propane gas leak in their system that fueled the Umberto Vidal disaster. But the gas company's parent company, Enron Corporation, points out that the Umberto Vidal building had no propane gas service. They argue that methane gas from the sewer system caused the explosion. Puerto Ricans want this mystery settled. Journalist Edward Zayas. Even though this happened in Rio Piedras, in a small area of, of San Juan, uh, the tragedy had a big, big, big impact in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a small island, and you don't have these kinds of events very often. This shook the people of Puerto Rico. Aptec's forensic engineers set out to determine where the explosion occurred by analyzing the structural damage and the direction of the blast shock waves. Propane gas is heavier than air and would have collected at the lowest point in the building, but methane gas rises, and Enron argues it got trapped between the second and third floor in a false ceiling. Aptec focuses on one vital indicator, 
a beam at the second floor level. Did the shockwave damage come from above or below? Jeff Grover. The second and third floors were totally destroyed by the explosion. Uh, but we can, by looking at the, the cracks in this beam at the second floor level and this column at the third floor level, you can determine the origin of the blast. This angled crack indicates that the, the explosion came from below and pushed this beam up. Similarly, the angle in the column means that the explosion came from inside and pushed the beam to the north to the outside of the building. Jeff Grover affectionately calls it the rainbow beam. If you compare this line to that line, you see that there's curvature to the beam. And in addition, there is, right over here, there's a dent in the beam that indicates something from below hit the beam. But according to the methane gas theory, the shock wave comes from above. So yeah, that should have pushed this beam downward. If it had a curvature, it should have been downward, and there should not have been the dent on the bottom side of the beam. The rainbow beam is compelling evidence that the explosion didn't occur above the second floor, dealing the methane gas theory a fatal blow. And Aptec finds one more vivid piece of evidence in the basement warehouse of the Umberto Vidal building. When an explosion occurs in the basement, the basement walls are surrounded by soil and very highly constrained. And so the, the explosion cannot go outward, so it has to go upward. It's like putting a firecracker in a tin can and the explosion will go upward. The basement was stocked with piles of new shoes, and investigators found strange markings on a beam from the basement ceiling, like cryptic symbols in the rubble, the scuff marks of the soles of shoes. Carlos Garrett. It was very difficult to try and explain how those shoes could have traveled upwards uh, with an explosion occurring above the level of where the shoes did travel. Uh, but the evidence as to the fact that the uh, explosion had indeed generated in the uh, basement uh, was overwhelming. Methane could not have settled in the basement, and it could not have exploded there. The theory is dead. The propane gas theory remains the only plausible cause. But if propane gas caused the Umberto Vidal explosion, where did it come from? A propane gas pipe was leaking in the street just up the road at the Chicken Kingdom restaurant, and the street slopes down towards the Umberto Vidal building. Did the propane gas travel underground, downhill, and accumulate in the basement? Aptek thinks so. It's very um, feasible for gas to migrate uh, from a leak in a pipe buried some distance from a building through the soil towards the building and make its way even through the tightest cracks and concrete walls uh, into an open space. But the gas company's investigators aren't buying it. They contend that finding a gas pipe leak up the road doesn't prove anything. One reason there are so few basements in the city is the high water table. They argue the ground under the street is wet and that makes the soil sticky and impermeable for gas. Aptec runs a test to find out whether propane gas could migrate through the soil. There is a lot at stake. And we felt that would go a long way to showing uh, the jury, if, if this were to go to trial, that the soil wasn't um, impermeable as the defense, as the gas company was intending to claim. The first challenge was to decide what kind of gas to pump into the ground. The local people were uh, pretty resistant to the idea of us using uh, propane because uh, everybody was pretty nervous at that point about possibly having another explosion. So we had to search for a gas that uh, had similar properties to propane. Aptek engineers settle on argon gas. The beauty of argon is that not only is it similar in physical properties to propane, but it's also inert. It, it can't explode. They pump argon gas into the ground near the restaurant and dig bar holes in intervals down the road towards Umberto Vidal. Everyone waits. If this test works, the gas company's case will be severely damaged. Then, at around the 10 minute mark, a reading of argon gas is found in the first sample hole. The gas is moving freely. 
the uh, gas company scientists took their own sample and went to their uh, uh, very elaborate uh, mobile lab that they had brought in and uh, took the sample in, shut the door, and a few minutes later came out with very long faces, very disappointed because they, they also obviously had seen argon in there and uh, they knew that was bad news for their, uh, their case. And how did the gas get through the foundation into the basement of the Umberto Vidal building? There were cracks. Um, a good portion of the basement floor actually was not concrete, it was uh, just soil and um, so gas could come into the ba uh, basement right through that soil. And then there were lots of perforations in the basement walls for older piping systems that were abandoned. And thanks to the air conditioning and the powerful smell of the new shoes, the smell would sometimes dissipate. The only constant, the look of concern on the face of store manager Arturo O'Neill. Very clearly, different people have different senses of smell. Uh, some people's noses are very sensitive uh, to uh, the odorants that are put in um, pipeline gases for the very purpose of making their presence known. Uh, other people um, can't smell as well and seem to not know or, or, or detect the gas. But one final mystery still remains. Arturo could smell the gas but every time the gas company's testing for propane gas came back negative. Investigators conclude that the massive Umberto Vidal building explosion that killed 33 people was caused by propane gas leaking from a pipe up the street that migrated underground and into the shoe store's basement. But an agonizing question remains. Why had Arturo reported gas smells for over a week, getting the gas company's technicians on site on four separate days, only to be told there was no gas in his store basement? The gas detecting equipment has been thoroughly tested, and it works. But the National Transportation Safety Board discovers a tragic flaw. The technician who tested the basement air didn't calibrate his equipment properly. He calibrated his leak detection equipment in the building, and so it, it read inaccurately, and so he wasn't getting a, uh, an indication of gas in the building. And that's why he, he couldn't confirm that there was gas in the building. To make matters worse, the gas technicians probing the soil for propane couldn't get proper readings because they weren't digging down deep enough. They only drilled bar holes 18 inches deep but the pipes and the gas seepage were about a foot further down. It was a catastrophic series of mistakes. It's not until the 28th day after the explosion that the last two bodies are recovered from beneath tons of debris. The body of store manager Arturo O'Neill, who had spent so many days with a premonition of the disaster, and the body of Jorge Ibanez Sanchez Sr., the air conditioning maintenance man. Investigators suspect they had both been in the basement just before the explosion occurred. Any small electrical spark in the basement could have ignited the massive explosion. But investigators eventually pinpoint the place in the basement with the most heat damage. The evidence is that the hottest part of the basement was right in the area of the air conditioning unit. And in the basement rubble, APTEC investigators find a charred base plate for an air conditioning thermostat and suspect that a short in the unit was what sparked the explosion. It took many days for the leaking propane gas to fill the basement. But what is shocking is how so little propane gas could have caused so much damage. Probably only about 10 pounds of propane, and that's actually less uh, than what you'll find in a full uh, barbecue tank container. So this is how lethal uh, propane is. The Umberto Vidal disaster and the deaths of 33 people were entirely avoidable had San Juan Gas Company operators been better trained. As a wholly owned subsidiary of Enron Corporation, their training was the responsibility of Enron. The National Transportation Safety Board's final report singles out Enron Corporation, 
its failure to oversee adequately the operation of the San Juan Gas Company and ensure the proper training of its employees. In the end, Enron settled the case for $75 million in damages, but they only paid out $50 million before going bankrupt and had to be taken to court for the remainder of the settlement. But in 1996, Rio Piedras lost something much more profound. The emotional toll on both Orlando O'Neill and Maricela Loriano is so severe, it will be two years before either can return to work. Even though nine years have passed, every day at some point in the day, there isn't an instant when I don't have a flashback or a memory of that day. And Maria Lopez, not at work that fateful morning, still misses her boss Arturo and her colleagues. For me, it was very difficult to lose them. Thank God I wasn't there, but in the beginning, I kept thinking to myself, I should have been there with them. 